It was a bitter winter's night when I moved into the old Willow Apartments, a looming gray structure nestled in the heart of the city. A fresh start, I told myself, eager to leave the past behind. My apartment was on the seventh floor, room 703. The landlord, Mr. Davis, was a peculiar man. He had an eerie stillness about him, the kind you'd associate with a porcelain doll. His icy blue eyes were always shielded behind a pair of thick, foggy spectacles. He lived on the ground floor, always keeping a watchful eye on the comings and goings. My new neighbors seemed cordial, albeit a bit odd. There was Martha, an elderly woman living across the hall. She had a strange obsession with her houseplants, which she would talk to as though they were her children. And then there was Alex, a young man living two doors down, who always kept to himself, seldom seen outside his apartment. The first few weeks were uneventful, but then the strange occurrences began. It was the smell at first, a horrid stench that seemed to emanate from the walls. Despite numerous complaints, Mr. Davis insisted he could smell nothing. Then, there were the inexplicable events. My keys would go missing, only to reappear in the most unlikely places. I'd wake up to find my furniture moved, or the taps running. I blamed it on stress, exhaustion, even my forgetfulness. But a deep-seated unease was starting to take root. The situation escalated when Martha abruptly left one day. No warning, no goodbye. Her apartment was left in a state of disarray, her beloved plants wilting and unattended. Alex was next. One morning his door was ajar, his apartment empty, save for a single chair in the middle of the room. The silence in the building was deafening. I was the last tenant, save for Mr. Davis, who remained as elusive and nonchalant as ever. The fear was palpable, an unwelcome guest that refused to leave. It was then that I realized, the building wasn't haunted by specters or phantoms, no, it was something much more realistic, much more human. As days turned into weeks, I began my own investigation. Each apartment held clues. Martha's plants, wilting and dying. But one, a crimson-leafed begonia, oddly thriving. In Alex's apartment, the solitary chair, but upon closer inspection, there were scratch marks on the floor, as if heavy furniture had been dragged. I soon began to notice the odd behavior of Mr. Davis. He seemed to be everywhere always watching, always listening. His appearances would often coincide with the strange happenings. The pungent smell was strongest near his apartment. I decided to confront him, but as I approached his door, I noticed it was slightly ajar. Inside, the apartment was dark, the air stale and the same horrid stench permeated the space. The walls were lined with old newspaper clippings, all of them about missing persons in the city. Then I discovered the horrifying truth. In a hidden drawer in his desk, I found a set of keys. They were duplicates to every apartment in the building. It was Davis. He had been entering our apartments, moving things around, creating an atmosphere of fear and paranoia, driving the tenants out one by one. His motive was rooted in greed. He intended to drive out the current tenants with his staged hauntings, making the property appear undesirable. Once they left, he planned to renovate the units turning the place into a high-end luxury apartment complex and rent it out for a significantly higher price. His was a terrifyingly calculated game of fear and manipulation for profit. Confronted with the reality of his actions, I gathered all the evidence and called the police. They found Davis in his apartment, surrounded by his collection of keys and his chilling newspaper clippings. He was arrested and the apartment building was evacuated. After Davis was taken into custody, I moved out of Willow Apartments carrying with me not just my belongings, but also a heavy lesson about human nature. I found a new place across town, a small, quiet apartment that provided the fresh start I originally sought. As for the old building, it was bought by a new owner who had no knowledge of its dark past. They renovated the apartments and the new tenants, to my knowledge, lived there peacefully. Davis, on the other hand, was charged with harassment, trespassing, and invasion of privacy. His twisted game had come to an end. Looking back, my time at Willow Apartments was a stark reminder that the real world can be just as chilling as any horror story. I learned that sometimes the scariest things aren't supernatural, but the lengths a person can go to for greed. But that's a chapter of my life I've closed. Now, it's just a story I tell. A chilling account from my past. Moving into Alder Heights an old apartment building in a quiet part of town was a necessity rather than a choice. 
My budget was tight, and the affordable rent was appealing. Mr. Jensen, the landlord, was a man of few words. He gave me the keys to apartment 312 with a stern nod, his expression unreadable. My nearest neighbor was Miss Doris, a retired teacher who lived alone. She was a lively woman in her late seventies, full of stories about the building and its past tenants. Our friendship was swift and unexpected. She reminded me of my own grandmother, and her stories were fascinating, often filled with humor and wisdom. One morning, I was startled awake by a loud thud from Miss Doris's apartment. I rushed to her door, my heart pounding. It was ajar. Inside, I found Miss Doris on the floor, unconscious. I called an ambulance immediately, but it was too late. Miss Doris had passed away. The following weeks were eerie without Miss Doris's laughter and stories echoing down the hallway. I felt an unshakable sense of loneliness and dread creeping into my apartment, a sentiment echoed by other tenants I spoke to. Several weeks after her passing, I started to notice strange things. There was an unexpected knock on my door late one night. When I opened it, there was a package wrapped in brown paper. It was addressed to Miss Doris with a return address I didn't recognize. I decided to open it, hoping it might provide some closure. Inside the package was a series of letters and a small, old-fashioned locket. The letters were from a man named George, who claimed to be Miss Doris's long-lost son. He wrote about trying to reconnect with his mother, about wanting to meet her and make amends. The locket contained a faded photograph of a young woman who bore a striking resemblance to Miss Doris and a baby boy. As I read through the letters, I was pulled into a world of regret, lost time, and a longing for reconciliation that never happened. I decided to reach out to George, to let him know about his mother's passing. I found him through the return address, and we met at a local cafe. It was a bittersweet meeting, filled with stories about Miss Doris that I had never known. George was grateful for the closure, and in turn, he shared some of Miss Doris's belongings with me. A collection of her favorite books, some handwritten recipes, and a small, framed photograph of her. As the weeks turned into months, I found myself cherishing the items George had given me. The books and recipes became a part of my everyday life, a comforting presence in the quiet apartment. The framed photograph of Miss Doris found a spot on my living room shelf, her smiling face a reminder of the friendship we'd shared. The sorrow of her passing was still present, but it was now accompanied by a sense of understanding and acceptance. Life in Alder Heights continued, each day a testament to the unexpected connections we make, the stories we share, and the lasting impact they can have on our lives. In the end, it was not just an apartment building, but a place where life happened in its most profound and mundane ways, where memories were etched into every corner, every brick, every door. When I first moved into the city, I was fresh out of art school, optimistic yet burdened by student loans. I found a home in a dilapidated brick-and-mortar relic named the Baker's Loft. Once a bustling bakery in the Roaring Twenties, it now housed those who could barely keep up with the city's fast pace. The Baker's Loft was located in a forgotten corner of the city, but it was all I could afford. Its residents were an eclectic mix of folks, each living in their own world. Among them, one man stood out, old Mr. Crowley. He lived across the hall from me, a former artist who had seemingly turned his back on the world outside his apartment. In the beginning, life at the Baker's Loft was uneventful. I spent my days searching for inspiration and my nights trying to capture it on canvas. But everything changed when I received the first package. It was a small box filled with high-quality art supplies, left anonymously at my doorstep with a note that read, For Sam, Apt 5B. At first, I was thrilled, assuming one of my friends was being generous. But as more packages arrived, each tailored to my artistic needs and struggles, it became unnerving. How did this person know I was running out of a particular shade of blue, or that my favorite brush was frayed? One day, as I was leaving my apartment, I bumped into Mr. Crowley. I had rarely seen him outside his apartment, and his appearance startled me. He mumbled something under his breath and hurriedly shuffled past me. As he did, I noticed a streak of blue paint on his hand. It was the same shade I just received in my latest package. The realization sent chills down my spine. Was Mr. Crowley the one leaving these gifts? The thought was both unnerving and intriguing. My suspicions were confirmed when the next package arrived. Inside was a sketchbook, and on the first page 
a sketch of me standing by my window, a scene only visible from Mr. Crowley's apartment. It was an unsettling revelation, but there was no sense of threat. Rather, I felt an odd connection with Mr. Crowley. It was as if this reclusive artist, forgotten by the world, was living vicariously through my art, nurturing my talent from the shadows. Life at the baker's loft took on a strange rhythm. Each day was marked by the arrival of these anonymous gifts, and my art began to thrive under this silent mentorship. It was a peculiar bond, a silent understanding formed within the walls of this old apartment building. 